Um, Emily, before you go too far, could you bring the, this up for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just want to test your skills as yeah, a servant. Well, you know, <laughs> Thank you. I wish I still could. Wow. What a great servant of Grace Commons Church. <laughs> Uh, it just, it was a softball thrown to me. I had to, I had to. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, what an exciting morning we have this morning installing Emily Kreider, and now I get to somehow follow that up. Um, if you don't know me, my name's Kelsey Walega. I have the privilege of co-directing our new young adult ministry here at Grace Commons. And long before I uh, did young adult ministry or was here at this church, I was an athlete at the University of Alabama. Roll Tide. It's been too long since I've talked about Alabama, so I've got to talk about it. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Uh, so at Alabama, I ran both cross country and track, and training for these two sports is incredibly demanding. Depending on the time of year, I would run anywhere from 65 to 90 miles a week, and trust me, my knees ache just hearing that number now. I don't run that much. And I would fit all of these runs into nine miles, and you might be thinking to yourself, Kelsey, there's only seven days a week. Correct. And we would only run six days a week, so we would cram nine runs into six days, which meant that every morning I would wake up, we would have practice from 6 to 8 a.m., where we would run, lift weights, or both. Then I would start class at 9, go to class all day until 3, where we would have another practice from 3 to 6. Then I would eat dinner, finish whatever homework I had, and I would be in bed between 8.30 and 9 every night, six days a week. And this isn't even including all the time in physical therapy, massages, chiropractor appointments. Being an athlete in college was a full-time job. My whole life revolved around training and racing. But every week, no matter what, we rested on Sundays. And Sundays were glorious because on Sundays, I was just a normal college student. On Sundays, I could sleep in until, get this, 6.30. Huh? <laughs> instead of waking up at five. And on Sundays, I could eat whatever I wanted because I didn't have to fear my breakfast or my lunch reappearing at practice later that day because I didn't have practice that day. And on Sundays, I would do things like read a book for fun, for fun. I could go on a walk if I wanted to. I could go to the movies. I could run or watch as many reruns of Gilmore Girls as I wanted to. On Sundays, I rested, and Sundays were glorious. For one day a week, my mind, my body, and my soul got to rest before another week of training began. And while I was in college, I seriously thought that I would run professionally after school. I thought my life would continue to be running and training for years and years to come. But I did not end up running professionally. <clears throat> my time as someone who trained and ran competitively came to an end. And what I couldn't have known at the time but what I see clearly now is that my seventh day rest each week from training was a foretaste of what my life would be like once I was no longer training and racing competitively. My life now is now one long rest day from running because my knees will no longer allow for it. My life is now one long Sunday where I can go on leisurely walks, where I have time to read books, where I can continue to watch reruns of Gilmore Girls. I don't have to worry about what I eat, worrying if it's gonna come back up on a 14 mile run because I am not going on 14 mile runs. The seventh day rest that I took each week in college was a glimpse into what was to come when I was no longer running competitively. My seventh day rest as a runner was practice for my life now. Some of you may see where I'm going with this. If you don't, that's okay. Here's where I'm going with this. One day, our work on this earth and our life on this earth will cease. We will enter an eternal resting place known in scripture as the new heavens and the new earth. One day, our works and our striving will cease and we will eternally join God and rest. And taking one day each week to rest now is a glimpse and a foretaste of this rest that is to come. One pastor I listened to called it eternity practice, which as an athlete I feel fond of. The Sabbath is one day each week to practice eternity. And today we'll be in Hebrews chapter 4. 
And one of the things it seems like the author of Hebrews is trying to get across to his audience is that there is a connection between the rest that God took on the seventh day at the beginning of creation and the rest we will one day receive when our works on this earth have finished and we join God in his eternal rest. There is a connection, a link, some even call it a space and time that we can inhabit today known as Sabbath. The space and time is one day to remember the, lo- the rest we lost in the, in the garden and to celebrate the rest we will one day receive again. This day is a taste of what things would have been like if it weren't for our rebellion against God. And the Sabbath day rest is a glimpse and a foretaste to our eternal rest and Sabbath celebration in the kingdom of heaven. The Sabbath is one day to practice eternity. And each week we have the opportunity to rest, to celebrate, to practice eternity. And my question for us to consider this morning is what does practicing eternity actually look like? And does it matter? And before we get too far in today's passage, it was incredibly helpful for me to understand the context of Hebrews and this passage before I even began to wrap my mind around what the author was trying to say. Because I made the mistake of reading Hebrews 4 with no context, and I had no idea what he was trying to say. I was very confused as to why Randy assigned me this difficult passage, and I had no idea what I was going to say about the Sabbath today. So, context, very helpful. No one really knows who the author or the audience of Hebrews is. Lots of guesses, no one knows for sure. But what we can tell from Hebrews is that the author had a relationship with his audience, and we know that they, the author and the audience had a deep and thorough understanding of Old Testament scriptures. And this is an audience of Jewish Christians who, like so many at the time, were facing persecution, imprisonment, and some were even walking away from the faith entirely. So the author of Hebrews is trying to address this and encourage his audience to remain faithful to Jesus. And in Hebrews, there are four sections where the author compares Jesus to key people throughout Israel's history. And in each of these sections, the author is seeking to elevate Jesus as superior to anyone or anything else. And in so doing, challenging his audience to remain faithful to Jesus and not abandon him. And this morning, we're in a section where Jesus and eternity are being compared with Moses and the promised land. What the author spells out just before in Hebrews chapter 3 is that Israel rebelled against God and Moses in the wilderness, and they lost their chance to enter God's rest in the promised land. And so now in chapter 4, the author is saying, okay, let's make sure we don't rebel against Jesus and lose our chance to rest in the new heavens and the new earth. Let's learn from their mistakes and remain faithful to Jesus. Another reason I discovered this passage can be a little confusing is because rest, the word rest in English is used 10 times in 11 verses. But in Greek, there are three different words used for rest, and they all mean something different. One word means just to rest, one word means resting place, and one word means Sabbath rest. I'm not like the Reverend Emily Kreider who speaks Hebrew. I cannot speak Greek, but those are the Greek words if you want to try to pronounce it in your head, but um, I don't have the skill set to do that. So, finally, we can read this morning's passage. We'll be in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 to verse 11. I'm going to read it on the screen because Kier is amazing. And any time that rest means resting place, she replaced it for us. Therefore, since the promise of entering his resting place still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed enter that resting place just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my resting place. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my resting place. It still remains that some will enter that resting place, and those who formerly formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. 
Therefore, God again set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's resting place also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that resting place so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. So the author of Hebrews desires that we would not be like the wilderness generation and rebel against the ways of God. He desires that we follow the way of Jesus and not rebel against him so that we don't forfeit our inheritance of rest in the new heavens and the new earth. The author of Hebrews is trying to get across to us that it is foolish to rebel and disobey because in so doing, we forfeit a very good gift of eternal rest. And he's also saying that we have the opportunity to practice eternity. We have the opportunity to rest from our work just as God rested from his. Not just one day in the future, but today we have the opportunity. The Sabbath is one day each week to practice eternity. And there's a lot we could discuss in this passage, but for the sake of time, they gave me 20 minutes, not two hours. We're just going to focus on, thanks for the chuckle over here, appreciate that. We're just going to focus on verses 9 to 11. And in verse 9, the author writes that there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And the Greek verb, I'll try to pronounce it, sabbatismos, used here for Sabbath rest, is not just Sabbath rest, but many commentators point out that it also means Sabbath celebration. It's a verb that, spe- that stresses the special aspect of Sabbath rest that is characterized by festivity and joy. The Sabbath celebration is a way that we can express our adoration and our praise of God. It describes the quality of rest we can enter each week that will one day be fully experienced in our yet-to-be-entered heavenly rest. It seems that the author of Hebrews is saying that this future Sabbath celebration is the ultimate blessing. And it remains for those who persevere as the people of God, not for those who fall away through unbelief. And it is not just a future Sabbath celebration that we can enter, but a Sabbath celebration we can enter each week. There remains a Sabbath rest for us today as the people of God. And then the author continues in verse 10 and writes that for anyone who enters God's resting place also rests from his own work just as God did from his. The author here is speaking now of the resting place in heaven but he just spoke of the Sabbath celebration. So it seems like he's bridging these rests together. He's saying that there is a Sabbath rest and celebration for the people of God. That is one day, it is in the age to come, but it can also be experienced today. Dan Allender in his book on the Sabbath writes that the Sabbath is a feast day that remembers our leisure in Eden and anticipates our play in the new heavens and earth with family, friends, and strangers for the sake of the glory of God. And then he goes on to write, and he say, he's, man, my words this morning. He says, the Sabbath is one day that holds together the beginning of time and the end. It is the intersection of the past and future that opens a window into eternity each week. Celebrating the Sabbath today is a glimpse into the new heavens and the new earth. Celebrating the Sabbath today is a glimpse into the rest we will one day enter. Celebrating the Sabbath is our chance to practice eternity. And what it requires of us is to set aside our work and rest for one day just as God rested from his. To enter God's rest means we set aside our work and be present to the only one who can give us rest. And the author continues in verse 11. And he writes this, let us therefore make every effort to enter that resting place so that no one will fall by following their, their being the wilderness generation, their example of disobedience. The author is speaking of heaven, the place where we will join God in his rest forevermore. He's saying, make every effort to enter that rest. Don't fall away. Don't rebel, don't disobey like those in the wilderness generation. Make every effort to follow the way of Jesus. 
Make every effort to enter his rest, both today and forevermore. And the longer I've sat in this passage, the more that the Spirit has continued to reveal to me and the more that my mind has been blown by this text. Because the author is certainly saying that there is an eternal rest that we will enter in the new heavens and new earth if we would just stay the course and remain faithful to Jesus. And also, I've begun to wonder if the author of Hebrews is not also trying to say that one of the ways you can remain faithful to Jesus is by observing the Sabbath. One way not to rebel, not to fall away, not to choose your own way is by practicing eternity each week. One way to remain faithful is by practicing Sabbath and resting and celebrating each week. Because if you think about it, it would be really hard to fall away, to rebel, to choose our own way when one day a week is set apart for the glory and praise of God. It would be really hard to fall away, to rebel, to choose our own way when we are celebrating, playing, feasting, and enjoying this life that the Lord has gifted us with. It would be really hard to fall away, to rebel, to choose our own way when we are in connection instead of disconnection with our loved ones, with ourselves, with creation, and with God. It would be really hard to fall away, to choose our own way when we are living out of the perfect harmony and peace of heaven instead of the chaos and the brokenness of this world. It would be really hard to fall away, to rebel, to choose our own way because our lives would be centered around the anticipation of this rest and the celebration each week. And it would be really hard to fall away, to rebel, to choose our own way because the other six days of our week would be born out of the residual of this one day of resting, celebrating, feasting, and praising God. It would be really hard to fall away, to rebel, to choose our own way because the kingdom of heaven is everything our world is not. And one day a week, we have the opportunity to practice being there. But I should say this before we fall into legalism and more works, as we are wont to do as humans. If you don't practice the Sabbath, this does not mean that you will not gain entry into God's rest. It does not mean that you are excluded. If you don't practice eternity now and take one day each week to rest and celebrate, you will still know what to do in heaven. You will still be able to experience the fullness and the goodness of the kingdom of heaven. Not observing or remembering or practicing Sabbath will not exclude you from the kingdom of heaven. So hear me when I say that. However, if you have the opportunity to practice eternity each week and catch a glimpse of what the kingdom of God is like, why would you not jump on that opportunity and accept that good gift? A few years ago, Carol Aust, Aust, you can correct me if I'm saying her last name wrong, she gifted us with this painting titled Welcome Home, and Lindsay Waymeyer brought this painting back to mind this week. She said, I think this is what you're trying to get at in your sermon, as she often is. She was correct. What I love about the sermon, what? What I love about this painting, it's a fine sermon. What I love about this painting is that it images the hope of the new heavens and the new earth, when all of God's people will be gathered together as new, whole, holy people. This painting images the eternal wholeness, peace, rest, flourishing, and celebration that we will experience. This painting images God's eternal resting place. And also, it seems like this painting images what it would look like for us today to enter that rest and celebrate the Sabbath. One day where we come together and enjoy connection with one another, where we share a meal, where we play outside, where we welcome others to join us. One day that it's a glimpse and a foretaste into the new heavens and the new earth. One day of practicing eternity. Because to me, all the people in the painting look like they're practicing eternity. It looks like they are experiencing and celebrating the good gift that the Lord has given them through Sabbath. And if you're like me, some of you in here may be thinking, well, this is all great and good, Kelsey, but what does practicing eternity actually look like? Especially if you have young kids or maybe a family that doesn't want to do it with you or a demanding season of work or school or you just don't want to do it alone. I don't know what it is. What can practicing eternity actually look like? 
Practicing eternity can look like setting your phone aside for one day and allowing yourself to be present with those around you. Practicing eternity can look like one day where you are not endlessly scrolling through Twitter or your news feed only to be angered by people in the world. Practicing eternity can look like one day where you participate in activities that truly bring you delight and joy. Practicing eternity can look like one day where you don't just petition God for unanswered prayers, but you rather praise and adore and thank God for all that he has done and all that he has yet to do. Practicing eternity can look like one day where you stop, you cease, and you rest from your striving and enter God's invitation of rest. Practicing eternity can look like one day where you choose not to buy or consume more products that the world says you need, but instead are at peace and rest with what you have. Practicing eternity can look like one day where you do not worry, but you trust and you abide in God. And practicing eternity can look like saying yes to all of the things that bring you into connection with God, yourself, others, and creation, and saying no to the things that bring you into disconnection with God, yourself, others, and creation. And if one day still feels like too big of a commitment and impossible for you right now, then just choose one hour each week where you practice eternity. John Mark Comer would say that it is important to start where you are and not where you want to be. So maybe for you that means you start with a few hours or one hour instead of a whole day. Something is better than nothing. Cody and I are still figuring out what this looks like for our family with differing schedules, a young child. We haven't cracked the code. And we haven't entered a full day of rest yet, but we are seeking to do something rather than nothing because this seems like too good of a gift to give up. Because I'll confess here that I really enjoy reading about the Sabbath and learning about the Sabbath. I could could give a lot of sermons about the Sabbath at this point. But to actually observe and practice and celebrate the Sabbath feels really daunting. So Cody, I'm committing us to do something rather than nothing. He gave a wave, so for those of you online, he said, yeah. The Sabbath is one day each week to remember the rest we lost and to celebrate the rest we will one day receive again. One day where we cease from our works to acknowledge that we are not the ones who are holding this world together. One day to receive the gift of rest that was made for us. One day each week to practice eternity. So in a moment, we're gonna hear another testimony of what it looks like to practice eternity. Before we do that, if you would, um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you are incredibly good to us. Lord, we are grateful for the promise of eternal rest and the new heavens and the new earth. Lord, we are grateful for your example and the rhythm you've set in motion at the beginning of creation of setting our work aside on the seventh day and resting. So Lord, would you help us as we seek to enter this rest each week? Lord, would you help us as we are seeking to practice eternity, to live in your rest, to live out this good gift that you have given us? Lord, because we know that this world is broken and it is chaotic and there is evil all around. And Lord, this morning I'm especially thinking of Turkey and Syria. Lord, a place that has experienced so much loss. And Lord, I'm at a loss for words of what to pray for them. So Lord, just ask that you would comfort them, that you would wrap your arms around them, that you would help them sort through this loss and this destruction, Lord, and help them rebuild, help them become whole again, help them to flourish again amidst so much loss, so much brokenness. Lord, we think of all those even in our midst this morning who may be hurting, or broken, or suffering in some way, Lord, we lift that to you, acknowledging that you are here even amidst all of that. Lord, we are so grateful that even amidst all the brokenness, all the hurts, all the evil in this world, you are still at work. Your kingdom is still coming. Lord, so would you help us be the kingdom? Would you help us be kingdom-minded people? And would you help us as we seek 
to enter your rest, to enter your peace, to enter your wholeness and your flourishing, and to live out of that every single week. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And it's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Kelsey.